Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, and uh, welcome to uh, the launch of uh, Continuous Page. I'm Jack Hartnell from the University of East Anglia and um, uh, coming to you live from a rather cloudy bit of uh, Southern California where it's early in the morning here. Um, it's fantastic to see uh, so many of you uh, gathering and uh, yes, welcome. I wanted to say a very quick thank you to uh, the Cordial Research Forum, to Alex Bovey and to Fern Inch for hosting this event. Um, and fantastic to see so many of you here, um, getting up to 120 odd people. Um, uh, great to see some of our authors of the volume also starting to trickle in. It's really lovely to see at least your um, digital presence. Um, and also thank you to our panelists, uh, Lauren Kilroy Eubank, Sreya Chatterjee, uh, Sandy Williams and Dan Pett, um, who we'll hear from in a minute. I just wanted to spend a couple of uh, moments at the beginning of uh, the event saying something about the book that we're here in part to celebrate. Um, uh, it's um, a project that's been some time in the making, um, which began life as a Mellon funded workshop at the Cultural Research Forum back in the heady days of 2015, the heady pre-Brexit, pre-Trump, pre-pandemic days of 2015, if we remember them. Um, and it sought to bring together um, a group of experts who worked on continuous pages in the broadest possible sense. So we had people who worked on scrolls and rolls in a more traditional sense, but also on digital streams, film, other kinds of extendable endless um, material formats. And as our conversations continued over the course of a few workshops at the British Museum, at the Victoria Albert Museum, in the parliamentary archives as well, it became clear to us that I think some sort of publication would be of interest to what was, a, at least to many of us, a surprisingly large community of people who were interested in themes of continuity, endlessness, and the page in um, a broad sense. And this coincided fantastically about a year later with the Quartal Books Online's move from a PDF format um, uh, of their books to the uh, digital um, format. And this is where I'm going to try and share my screen to show you the result. I hope you can all see that there. Um, this is uh, Quartal Books Online and this is our volume, continuous page, scrolls and scrolling from papyrus to hypertext. It's an open access volume with 11 chapters and an introduction. Um, and uh, I hope, as you'll see, I'm just gonna briefly scroll over some of these titles uh, for you. Um, you'll see that it's extremely broad uh, in a number of ways. We stretch geographically from material on Japan, uh, India, uh, the Middle East, through to uh, Europe and the United States. It ranges chronologically from probably, I think the earliest material in here is around 1200, maybe slightly earlier, so the you know, 12th, 13th century, all the way through to uh, through um, Renaissance contributions, other early modern material and modern and contemporary works of art. And most importantly, to me at least, um, and I think to many of us who are involved in, in the journal too, in a volume rather too, um, they range materially extremely widely from parchment um, uh, handwritten parchment to um, uh, print on paper to painting, ceramic, um, uh, collage, even um, uh, some contributions are thinking through film and 4D material. And the best bit about the kind of coming together of our, I'm just going to navigate to my introduction here to show you this, the best bit about the coming together of our subject of scrolls with the kind of endless continuity of the digital world is that as well as many of the typical things you expect to see in a book, images um, in an online book as well, um, uh, not just images, but things like video here. Um, um, we've also been able to include in many of the chapters, these um, digital scroll objects, in this case, a 14th century apotropaic uh, scroll from Mamluk, Egypt, perhaps Mamluk, Syria. Um, objects that the reader can quite literally scroll their way through. So you can either kind of scroll your way through the actual object here, you can uh, zoom in to take in its detail or, or zip your way on the bottom right uh, along the length of the object. In this case, this is a, a scroll, as I've said, that um, through a combination of kind of magical and religious and superstitious writings and inscriptions, 
um, offered its user um, all kinds of apotropaic protection. Um, we uh, um, have included um, objects like this in a number of different parts of the volume. Um, so really, I do encourage you all, if you can, to uh, check it out. Um, I think it's a really fantastic thing. I want to congratulate all of our authors um, and thank them for their patience in us putting together what is, uh, I hope you appreciate was a slightly complicated but really rewarding book that I hope will be of interest to lots of different people. Um, I want to take this opportunity to really thank, um, give a huge thanks actually to Grace Williams, our fantastic designer, um, uh, who's really been tireless in helping us put together all the different details of this um, movable feast. Um, thank Jeff Moss and um, uh, the Courtauld IT team, and as well as um, Masha Mieva and uh, the Courtauld Books Online team more generally for, for all that you've done. To, uh, to help us with that. So thank you, um, cheers uh, with my coffee um, uh, to all involved and thank you very much. So um, I do encourage you to check it out. Um, tonight though, uh, um, or this morning or wherever you are in the world, whatever time it is, um, we wanted to celebrate the book and its ideas in some ways, not just through rehashing or going over it again, it, it's kind of specific contents as you can see, those are open access and there for you all to take a look at whenever you'd like. But instead, I think, I thought it would be more interesting for us to acknowledge that a book like this exists in what, especially recently, has become a fantastically busy and increasingly complex digital ecosystem for art history. Um, something which I'm sure almost all of us will have had to pivot towards, especially in the last few months due to the ongoing pandemic. And so today, what I thought we'd do to celebrate the book, but also to think more broadly about what we're doing in art history in this present moment, um, is uh, I've invited four uh, panelists, experts in their field from different parts of art history, museum world, public facing art history, research um, projects and um, uh, digital online journals um, to share their recent work that they've been doing in the digital space um, and to help us sort of think through or to kickstart a conversation as the title of our event suggests about bringing art online in a pandemic. Um, I suppose if I was to give us a mission statement for the next what will be roughly an hour and a half, it's to offer a variety, I don't wanna use the word solution, but a, a variety of um, tools, practical and intellectual for crafting an intelligent and responsible art history in these troubled times, especially a digital art history in these troubled times. Um, thinking through how, I guess, uh, as many colleagues in many other contexts have been doing in the last few weeks, um, to think through how, in spite of some of the you know, really devastating locks out, lockdowns and closures of recent months that we've all been experiencing, how in spite of that, new opportunities are always presenting themselves online for our community to flourish, communicate, share ideas um, uh, in quite exciting ways. So in terms of format, um, I really do want this to be as open and a free flowing kind of conversation um, between our panelists and between you, the audience, as we possibly can have in such a setting. Um, each speaker, um, I'll introduce them um, uh, in turn. Four of them will give perhaps um, sort of a five or so minute introduction, um, which really just lets you know where they're coming from, it gives you a kind of sense of their work at the moment. And soon after that, we'll break into discussion perhaps first among the panelists. And then um, it, really throughout, I wanna try and incorporate and take in as much um, uh, kind of conversation as we can from the participants and attendees in the audience as well. There are two ways that you can uh, contribute if you'd like to, and I would really appreciate it if you did. Either you can click on the Q&A chat box at the bottom, type in a particular question, and I will do my best as moderator to feed it into the conversation as and where I can. Or if you want to use the raise hand option, you can do that as well. Um, and uh, we will switch on your microphone and you can speak directly to the panel and ask a question like you would do if you were in uh, a normal room. Um, as I said, I'll do my best to bring in as many different voices as we can, although with 160 odd people, I, I would appreciate it if, um, I'm sure we all would, if the uh, contributions were kept kind of focused and, and brief. Um, 
but uh, I also want to just say that we're not only, um, uh, in a sense, I want these discussions to continue onwards as much as they can do. And to help that, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to our workshop rapporteur, um, uh, Liv Croyle, who from the University of East Anglia, who is going to be um, kind of um, a stenographer, so to speak, um, gathering together any resources, tools, concrete things, bibliography, things like that, that might be mentioned throughout the event uh, into um, a PDF document, which I'll then share with everybody after the event. So we have a sense of uh, a kind of shared um, uh, resource set of resources for moving forward so i hope that all makes sense um you can contribute again in the chat or by raising your hand um but now over to introducing um our panelists i'll introduce them one by one um as they speak um to give us a sense of who they are and to get this conversation going so up first um is lauren kilroy eubank lauren if you want to share your, start sharing your screen um, Lauren is the Dean of Content and Strategy for Smart History, as we'll hear, a not-for-profit that seeks to make art history accessible to everyone. Um, previously, she was a tenured Associate Professor at Pepperdine University, just down the road from uh, me here in California, and Assistant Professor at CUNY, where her um, research and teaching focused then, as it still does, on many things, um, including the global renaissance, and in particular, um, viceregal and uh, modern Latin America. So Lauren, thank you so much for being here. Over to you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you to the entire Courtauld Research Forum for uh, having us all come and talk today. Uh, so I, I, I could speak at great length about the things that I do. So I'll just uh, briefly introduce some of the projects and and things that I'm doing now at Smart History and hopefully people will have questions. So I want to assume that no one knows what Smart History is, so I'll do a little introduction. Uh, I am just in this summer, I left my job at Pepperdine and became the Dean of Content and Strategy at Smart History. And for anyone who doesn't know uh, what Smart History is or what we do, we are the most visited art history resource in the world. And we are a resource for lack of a better term where we are really supporting uh, students, instructors, lifelong learners who want to learn more about the history of art. And we're doing it, we're trying to do it in a way that's ex as accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, so I like to think of us as a massive public art history project, a resource, an interface. For me, it's kind of a way of life. Um, and it's all free. Uh, we don't have advertisements. Uh, we rely on donations and the support from many different foundations and grants. Um, what we do at Smart History that is, to some degree, I think, radical in terms of the field of art history is that we are uniquely collaborative in a lot of ways. And to give you a sense of what I mean by that, we have more than 400 people that we've collaborated with at Smart History, the majority of whom have PhDs, and they come from many different uh, realms, whether that's, you know, uh, professors working in academia, whether that's the museum world, and kind of everything in between. And what we're trying to do, like I said, is to make art history as accessible uh, and engaging to as many people as possible. And obviously, since it is online, it does mean that you have to have access to the internet and we can talk about accessibility things a bit more uh, later. Um, to give you some sense of what I think is the, the impact that we are having at Smart History, uh, we have currently, we, we record videos on site. And what I mean by that is if you are watching videos at Smart History, and just to, to show you what I mean, for instance, if I go here on our site, um, here a recent video which is the column of Trajan uh, what this in means is that members of the smart history team and in this case uh, the executive directors and founders of smart history Beth Harris and Stephen Zucker were in Rome in front of the column of Trajan recording a an unscripted conversation about this particular object and so our videos are intended to be accessible but also experiential conversational and and fostering that collaborative spirit that i mentioned earlier um, we also have essays and essays are also written by experts we very much value expertise in, in the collaborative effort that we champion and so combined we have more than three thousand essays and videos that span the globe uh, we also have a 
unique ecosystem, and Jack used this earlier, the, the idea of the ecosystem. We have a complicated ecosystem at Smart History. We have the main site that, that we are here, back in this landing page that I was showing you earlier. Uh, but we also have a YouTube uh, channel where all of our videos get posted. Uh, and we have about 194,000 subscribers. And we also, all the uh, photography that we take for our videos is done by Steven Zucker. And he also has a Flickr page with more than 10,000 photos that are freely available for people to use for non-commercial purposes. And we also post all of our material on Khan Academy. So we have a lot of different uh, audiences and a lot of different ways that we're trying to meet the needs of a very diverse audience across the world. Uh, like I said, we are the most visited artistry resource, resource in the world. And what I mean by that is we had, uh, just in the year of 2019, uh, we had 48 million views. And to give you some more recent statistics, because of this pivot to online, uh, where Smart History has very much tried to serve and fill um, uh, the, the needs of people who are finding themselves challenged by the online environment. Just in October of 2020, we had a more than a million page views for that particular month. And that's a more than an 80% increase from what we saw the year before. So we're seeing a lot of traffic and we have been trying to meet the needs, like I said, of people in a variety of ways, whether that's uh, more recently, we've wanted to offer professional development or to, to share with people what we do at Smart History, how to make a video, how to uh, create more beautiful images, how to find images that you can use for publications, for teaching that are in a public open uh, with a Creative Commons license or in the public domain. And so we've been, uh, we've just started with webinars for these professional development um, opportunities, and those will continue into the year of 2021. Um, just to uh, orient people, I think a little bit more to Smart History in case you are unfamiliar with it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we traverse the globe in many ways. Uh, there are different pathways to learning about the history of art here on the website. And so I just wanted to orient people very briefly because it touches on some of the topics that I think we'll discuss in, in more detail later. Uh, so we have on our landing page here, you can navigate to specific geographic regions uh, if that is you know, where people you know, want to find material. So let's say you want to go, or actually we'll go to the Americas here, you are interested in learning more about the Spanish vice royalties, uh, which is where some of my interests are, um, you can, of course, then go see all the content here. And you can find videos and you can find essays uh, that can, can be incorporated into classroom, into studying for exams, uh, into helping people uh, who need all of a sudden to, to learn about material for their own teaching purposes. And so you can find um, a variety of material. Uh, what we try to do at Smart History is for every video, we also usually have an essay and they overlap in different ways so that you, people, um, learners who are coming to the site have different pathways to understanding this material. And that is really important to us that, that we don't uh, provide a single unique way or one singular way of talking about something. Uh, the conversational videos and the essays are intended to provide an array of diverse voices so that people can understand the complexities of, of a particular object, an artist, a theme, etc. cetera. Uh, we also have a number of different types of pathways for people to engage with material, whether that's how we've collected it or curated it, uh, a term that gets used a lot these days, so that people can find this material differently or see it in connections differently. And what I what I wanted to show people was, for instance, um, here in guided learning, we have some of these different types of pathways, whether that's uh, particular projects that we have engaged in over the past several years. And one of those, for instance, is, oops, is called Arches, which is the at-risk cultural heritage education series. And so this was a uh, project funded by the NEH that was specifically to look at endangered cultural heritage. 
And so all of this content is in other sections of the site based on geography and time. But here it's collected and, and organized in such a way to provide certain thematic um, launching points for people to incorporate into their classes or to think about more specifically. And so we're, we're always very conscientious to think about how people might look for material or how they might step into that material on the website. And we're always trying to find creative pathways to, to helping people think and learn about uh, art history. Um, the last thing I'll say, I always have so much to say, but the last thing I'll say for the moment is, of course, this, like I said, is all free. Um, it is placed here on the site with a particular Creative Commons license. And what that means is people can remix and adapt to their heart's desire, uh, whether that's for class um, or some other purpose. And uh, all of the materials are, are actually, they do go through peer review. They go through an open peer review process. So again, fostering that collaborative spirit. Uh, and um, to respond, I think this was happening even before the COVID, but as, as a result of COVID, something that we have been thinking about more is also uh, limitations to uh, the online environment. Um, even say for people who have less stable or no internet connection. And so we have, uh, for instance, um, books, free books, uh, where people can access particular, uh, all the content in a section, but it's available as a PDF, meaning they can download it. If they so choose, they can print it out. Uh, but hoping that this also fills, say, a need in this time where, say, access to even the internet might be uh, challenging for some. So. I'll stop there and hopefully there are more questions and conversation where we can expand. Thanks, uh, Lauren. Fascinating and amazing to hear just, I mean, uh, not only the kind of content of the work, but uh, some of the amazing numbers there. It's fantastic that um, art history is reaching so many people through some art history in this way, I'm sure we'll all agree. Um, uh, our second um, panelist, um, Sriya, if you want to share your screen, is Sriya Chatterjee. Uh, who's a contributing editor at British Art Studies, uh, which I'm sure we'll hear more about in a minute, the open access peer reviewed journal co-published by the Paul Mellon Centre um, in London and the Yale Centre for British Art in New Haven. Um, and following her PhD from Princeton University, uh, she's now a Swiss National Science Foundation Fellow at the Institute for Experimental Design and Media in Basel and a, which is collecting institutional affiliations, and a research fellow at the Max Planck uh, Kunsthistorisches Institute, um, where she's continuing what is a kind of broad and really interesting body of research on the relationships between art, design, and political ecology, with a focus in particular on South Asia and Australasia. Um, but it's perhaps with her editorial hat that we'll hear her speak at least at first. Um, so over to you, Shreya. Thanks so much for being here with us. I, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I just want to check. Uh, do you see my screen? Because something odd yes. is happening. Okay, great. Yes, we do. Um, just a second. I. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And um, yeah, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about British art studies. As Jack said, I'm a creating editor there. So British Art Studies is uh, really a fully um, online peer-reviewed uh, scholarly journal, uh, which publishes on all aspects of British art and architecture um, in really its most diverse uh, and international contexts. So um, I, just a second, um, right. Uh, and so it's co-published by the Paul Mellon Center in London and uh, the Yale Center for British Art in New Haven. Uh, and it's, uh, it's still really one of the few fully open access publications uh, in the field of art history. And it's relatively new, uh, started uh, around the same time that um, Jack mentioned um, that the book we're launching today started in 2015. Um, and, uh, and I'm also a relatively new member having started earlier this year, pretty much alongside the pandemic. So, um, so everything's been quite virtual. Uh, one of the things that I want to do today is show you, really just run you through the website um, of British Art Studies 
um, and maybe talk about some of the practical ways in which uh, being a fully digital journal um, impacts the kind of scholarship uh, that is produced. So this here is the um, general website with all the issues and um, um, talking about some of the practical things that uh, are really helpful, have been really helpful for the journal. I'll um, show you this um, essay on the documentary photographer Bert Hardy. And the way that uh, incorporating an integrated film has been really helpful for, for the journal. So this uh, essay by Linda Neal and John Wyver um, on the photographer um, argued in a sense that uh, to understand um, Hardy's photographs, uh, documentary uh, images and sort of sound as well as the moving image is really important. So the authors created two films. Um, so you see the first film here. Um, I won't play it for you, but it runs for about 15 minutes. And so each the, the two films in each film looks at one photo essay by, by Hardy. And then the rest of the um, essay is kind of providing historical context around Hardy's photographs and the two um, photo essays, but also really reflecting on the process of making these films and how that change the way that the authors think about um, this kind of scholarship. Um, some other really handy tools uh, that I want to show you is, uh, yeah, this, this slider uh, function here, for example. So look, this allows us to very closely compare uh, kinds of images and is super useful for um, articles on conservation, restoration, and so on. So this, for what I'm showing you now, is a is an article on technical art history and miniatures uh, specifically. So you can see the slider tool being used um, in in different ways. But also um, things like close-up photographs, such as this, really allow for um, looking at the density of paint as well impact on the kind of argument you're making depending on the kind of article that you are writing um, as well. And another uh, very cool feature, I think, uh, is this 3D visualization. So this is a, a, a pilgrim badge, it's a medieval pilgrim badge from the British Museum. And uh, this 3D visualization allows you to, to move it around, uh, zoom in, and, and do things that it, is almost as close to having an object in your hand. And I think this kind of um, access um, allows for art historical and art theoretical arguments to proceed in a way that having just a, a flat 2D picture doesn't always allow you to, to do. Um, we also try to embed um, little snippets uh, rather than just describing processes, uh, but uh, little videos that allow you to talk about process. This, what you see here, is metal casting um, of a medieval pilgrim badge that I showed you earlier. So, so yes, yeah, so these are some of the handy tools um, that are used. In addition to all of this, um, something that the fully digital format allows for is that in addition to having you know the 10,000 word peer-reviewed scholarly essay um, an article you you can also have various features that play around a little bit they're all peer-reviewed well the features um, they allow you to play around with format a little bit so I'll show you my favorite one which is the cover collaboration this is not actually uh, peer reviewed, but this uh, allows for collaboration curators, artists, and provide a platform for um, presenting different kinds of uh, artworks. And so, if you um, so essentially every issue has more than one cover, a couple of covers from a particular series of artworks. And so, every time you open the journal, you every issue will have a different will come up and cover randomly assigned. But this the and the, the covers come from a cover collaboration, which is a feature. That, uh, I'll show you an example. So this this is a cover collaboration um, which by Annie Jail Kwan, um, 
And so here you'll have a series of images and uh, on a particular theme, but it also allows the, the person who initiates the project to, to write about it and talk about it and creates in a sense, uh, a sort of archive for uh, a lot of artists as well as curators and so on. So um, I can't show you this yet because it's coming up in the next issue. But one of the things that I'm really excited about, we've just finished uh, working on cover collaborations for the next issue. Um, and it coincides with um, a series that the Paul Mellon Center is still running on British arts and uh, nat uh, natural forces. And it's it's almost like a virtual exhibition curated by artist and curator and Chan and focuses on um, questions of environmental justice and ecocide um, and all sort of uh, inter uh, interests that I um, also currently share. Um, in in Britain, as well as in Britain's erstwhile colonies, making it a really sort of international uh, project. And um, stay tuned, as it's the next issue that comes out next week. So I'm sorry that we can't really look at it yet. Um, so the last um, feature that I really want to, to talk about is a really new one. So it's very, uh, it, we started, uh, thinking about it last year and it's animating the archive. We've only done one of these so far, but we have a couple forthcoming in, in, uh, in following issues. So this is something that really allows for, um, it's a peer feature and uh, it, it allows for archival material and research um, to be presented in, in a non sort of linear long form format, but uh, what happens is that you you have um, you have a show where you can scroll through and look through things. So this is one by Stephen, um, and it allows the viewer or the reader make their own narrative. So it, hopefully, it presents a way of reading and uh, doing things that uh, sort of single line format doesn't always allow you to do. So these are just a few things that um, that the journal has been experimenting with and doing, and I'd really like to talk more about um, you know sort of future digital uh, the future digital publishing as well as projects that we have in the pipeline, question access, audience, and so on. And I hope we can do that in uh, in discussions. Um, so I'll stop there because I, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, thank you. Thank you, Shreya. It's fascinating to see all of the different kinds of, uh, uh, kind of routes, as you said, for uh, kind of presenting material through. It's really exciting to see that coming to fruition and slightly um, shaming that you guys are now in your 17th issue and <laughs> the time it's taken us to produce uh, one book. But that says more, I think, about academia than it does about us. At least I'm deciding that's what the case is. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, our third of four speakers is uh, Sandy Williams, who I um, uh, is going to try and share her screen, but we'll see with some tech issues, I might share mine in her place and we'll just uh, hear her. Um, but uh, uh, Sandy's a, currently a PhD student in the history of art department at the University of Michigan. Um, but prior to that, uh, she was an assistant curator in the Art of the Middle East Department at uh, LACMA here in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, uh, and there she contributed to, uh, contributed to exhibitions on both historical Islamic art and uh, contemporary art from the Middle East material I know that continue in both forms in her ongoing research. Um, but she's here as well in her capacity as a founding member and the managing director of uh, Hamseen Islamic Art History Online, a project which I think we're going to hear more about. Ah, and I see you and I see your screen. Fantastic. So over to you, Sandy. Thanks so much for being here. I am going to turn off my video just in case it'll help with my video, my internet Great. streaming, which is misbehaving we, today. We know you're here. <laughs> we, we see you. We... Great. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm cut off the video feed now, which is hopefully going to improve the quality of this, but um, thank you, Jack, so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm really excited to learn about the ways in which people are using digital resources to spread art history around the world. 
And um, so, as you mentioned, yes, I'm the managing director of Hamseen Islamic Art History Online. It is a open access and free platform of digital resources for educators to teach about the field of Islamic art history and visual culture more broadly. And here I'll just show you, this is the homepage and a few of the presentations, but I'll take you to the main presentations page so we can really see more of what we have to offer. Um, the current iteration of Hamseen offers 28 short form video presentations ranging in topics from the early Islamic period all the way up to the contemporary moment. So here you can see we have a presentation on Byzantine and early Islamic textiles. And then all the way down here, these are not in chronological order. This was just one of the earlier videos we received. Um, we have a video on George Floyd and depictions of George Floyd in street art in Iran, Syria, and Afghanistan. So we're really covering um, right up to the present moment, which is exciting and something that is unique to having a digital platform rather than working with a publication, which as Jack had mentioned, takes a lot longer. Um, and so our idea for this project was really to make Islamic art history more accessible um, to a broader range of people and uh, also to open up the canon of art history, of Islamic art history. And we're doing that by including new voices, by forefronting emerging scholars, um, by including new material, for example, this, um, this presentation on George Floyd, and by making cutting edge research being done by these specialist scholars who um, are speaking on topics that are um, they are the leading voices in, but then making that accessible to uh, a, an audience who has no background in Islamic art history. Doing that, but also making this free so that people can learn about what is happening in the field of Islamic art history, the cutting edge research without having to pay a conference fee or a journal fee. They can just come here and learn about where the field is going really. Um, and the next thing I wanted to show is just one way in which we're doing that is through this living survey document in which we present all of um, all of our presentations in a single document. And it's very traditional in the sense that it's in a chronological and dynastic breakdown. And um, Everything that we have right now is organized in this document, but the idea is to make this, um, it'll continue to grow. So we kind of pull, pulled back the curtain a bit and you can see where we have gaps. Um, but also the idea is um, to allow scholars and educators to come in and think about creative connections they can make between different topics in Islamic art history. So to give them a platform that is organized in a traditional way, but that can be mixed and matched into creative connections that would convey um, some component of Islamic art history that we might not be able to anticipate. Um, and just to tie up, I timed myself very uh, precisely so that I would be five minutes, um, but just to tie up, um, I just wanted to show the team that has been leading this project to its fruition and give a little bit of the history of Hamseen, which is actually quite short. Um, because um, we've been in existence basically since the beginning of the year. And uh, we started as a conversation in the history of art department at the beginning of the year, pandemic, um, talking about how we could make Islamic art history more accessible, leveraging digital resources. Um, the pandemic happened and we scattered to our various places. And once we had a chance to regroup, we really, we came back to the conversation and realized that now was our moment and there was a real sense of urgency behind making this project happen. So we organized, um, so starting in May, we organized our team of six. We started working with uh, scholars to create the presentations. We secured funding from um, a very, we're very lucky to have on campus an organization called the Digital Islamic Studies Curriculum or DISC, which is supported by the Mellon Foundation. And so we secured funding through them. Um, and we built our website and launched our website on October 20th. So we have really created something in five months, essentially. Everything you're seeing here is the result of five months worth of work, um, but an in, in intense amount of work. And I have to say thank you to Bitter Asener, who's here. 
um, in the audience, she created this beautiful website. Um, and just, you know, this is a labor of love and we're happy to have this continue to exist and grow. We have some really, um, even though we have a short history, we are looking forward to a long future and we have really great ideas for where to go next. For example, an interactive and multilingual glossary. And um, our ultimate goal at the end is to create a MOOC or a massive open online course using the presentations that we're creating and gathering. So um, just to end, I would like to just say thank you to the team because really I'm just here as a representative but this has been a collaborative effort between uh, the six members of our team and also to the contributors who spent a lot of time creating these presentations. We've learned it's not easy. Um, so that's, that's what I've got to say about Hamseen and I hope people will continue to follow us. We are on social media. I know there were some questions coming in on the chat box about social media and I can share those at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sandy. That's great to see and really fascinating to see kind of and to hear a tantalizing mention. Maybe we'll come back to some of the future parts of a project that's been put together, as you say, fantastically uh, quickly. And it's really interesting. We're starting to see what it looks like having projects that are almost at different moments in their progression, comparing smart history, British art studies and um, uh, and uh, Hansen as well. Um, our last speaker, before we then start to, to break into conversation, I do encourage you uh, to continue to pop in questions in the chat. Um, and afterwards, you can also raise your hand, as I mentioned, um, but I'll refresh that in a second. But um, before we get to that, um, uh, our last speaker, um, Dan Pett, um, uh, is the head of digital and IT at the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge. Uh, about which I'm sure we will hear more now. Um, previously, uh, Dan was the Digital Humanities Lead at the British Museum, where amongst other things, just to give you a sense of the really broad scope of things he's worked on, uh, he, he uh, worked on 3D capture projects, one of which I believe it was in fact the um, uh, Pilgrim badge um, uh, material that um, Sreya just shared from British Art Studies, or at least Dan was involved in that project. Um, so he worked on 3D capture projects, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, something which I think would be really interesting to hear more about, and also helping to design and build the award-winning portable antiquities scheme database, which holds uh, a record of over 1.3 million objects. Lots of figures in the millions here with some of these digital projects, really fascinating to, to hear about. So Dan, thank you so much for being here, over to you. Thank you, Jack. I'm just gonna try and share my screen as well for you. Um, those talks are really fascinating and I'm going to try and pull a few things together as well. I think I'll start off by paying tribute to the people who work in digital practice in museums and say how much they've done over the last six to nine months. We've been standing on a digital precipice looking out over that void with a bit of fear and trepidation about what we're going to achieve. But what all the speakers have shown so far is about how much the internet has actually changed their world over the last year and how the continuous page that Jack has written about in his work and his contributors it's sort of transferring from the analog to the digital. And we've now got this resource that is now growing at such a rate and at such a pace that we can't actually keep up with a lot of the things we're doing. We're all searching for relevance and how we're actually gonna become the next big thing in digital and how we can capture the public's imagination. And over the last year, we, we've all been searching for something new and interesting to do that makes people come to our resources. So I work at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, um, Many of you might know that museum. It has a fabulous entrance. It's got an amazing collection. It's got antiquities, it's got art, it's got flat art, it's got three-dimensional art. It's got all this stuff that we want to show off to the public in different ways. But how do we do that? That's the really big challenge. So one of the things that we've been working on over the pandemic was very much like Sandy talked about that rush to deliver. So we decided that we'd like a showcase to show off what we're up to. So here on screen, I hope you can all see it is a beta website that we built for the Fitzwilliam Museum, which we began in April and we delivered um, in July, but didn't actually go live with the public until uh, last month. And uh, This website is built completely on open source technology, which looking at the resources that other people have shown is similar. Many people are using WordPress to run their sites or they're using open source technology or really freely available stuff. So things like YouTube and Twitter and Instagram, these things that you can actually reach out to the public with and capture their imagination all there. So this website is a big challenge. It's kept me up at night. It's kept other people up at night. We've all been trying to do new things. We're putting things on here that people might want to see. So you can't visit a museum at the moment generally. So what can you do to make that accessible to people? 
this thing's like 360 degree tours. So if I scroll down this web page, on the very front page, we've got access to have a look around the museum. So we have different scenes as you walk around the museum in different places, which you can zoom in, you can see the objects, but you can't actually get that much information from here. But technology is starting to allow us to do new things with that. Jack mentioned the Digital Pilgrim project earlier. I can't take much credit for that. That's Amy Jeff's work. And it was a fantastic article to be involved with British art studies. But 3D technology can bring objects alive. So things like this, Sketchfab, it's one of the only profitable startups that are out there, is allowing people to put 3D objects up and you can interrogate them and turn them around in three dimensions. You can print them off at home. Serendipity is now key for this sort of stuff. People can download the work, they can print it off, they can mash it up. And one of the things that we should be talking about is, is open access to resources as well and allowing people to take these things away and do new and really interesting things with our artwork. Do we own this material? How do we make scholars have access to this sort of stuff? I wrote so many notes down listening to the other speakers. There's technology that's making things really accessible to public as well now. Things like IIIF for deep zooming images, so you can zoom into the little details. I'll try and bring an object up so you can have a look at it in three dimensions as well now. So hopefully you can all see this. This is a famous statue in the entrance to the Fitzwilliam Museum. This was scanned in about three minutes just before the pandemic using an Artex scanner. It was put online the same day. People can download this, they can take it home, they can mix it up and put it something out there with it. So just navigating back. So there's many challenges out there at the moment for all of us. We've talked about collaborative work as well. Lauren talked about 400 PhD people collaborating to make their resource. We're trying to collaborate with the public for the Fitzwilliam Museum resource. We want the public to tell us what they want. And this is something that we should all be thinking about is what the public actually want to achieve with digital. And that's where I'm going to finish. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. It's fascinating. I, I find that image really compelling of someone dashing in just before the lockdown to do a quick 3D scan and get something online uh, that kind of uh, really symbolizes some of the urgency here, um, especially in the museum sector. Um, so I uh, invite all of the um, panelists to um, pop your screens and um, mics back on um, uh, where we can. Um, and really just to, yeah, thank you so much for these. I mean, I'm just been, as, as Dan said, also scribbling down all sorts of really interesting points of contact between these different research projects, as I said, at different stages in their lives, um, but also um, uh, uh, with different audiences or different types of audiences. And yet nonetheless, you know, some of the big themes that I've been coming up with all kind of noticing collaboration is a huge part of this work. Um, uh, the kind of relationship between the experience, the experiential, I think was something that um, Sharia mentioned in terms of British art studies, uh, as well as uh, Lauren in terms of smart history, but the experimental, how the kinds of things that we're doing in these worlds are slightly different. The different routes that we are plotting for our various audiences through our material, especially given, as uh, Dan said, it was so large in terms of the pace of change. Um, but also um, thinking about access as well. That's going to be a big thing. I think we're going to want to come back to um, thinking about um, uh, uh, the different languages in relation to home scene, for instance. Um, as well as uh, all sorts of different tools in terms of small history, Bashar studies and, and the Fitzwilliam. So we've got um, questions coming in, which is fantastic. I do encourage anyone who has anything you want to ask about um, uh, to pop it in the chat or to raise hand and I should be able to see that. We can switch your microphone and you can uh, unmute. We can unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to, in, in a sense, throw it open to you all and to say, um, I don't want to dwell too much on the pandemic um, uh, and really to start to open this out, but I guess I'm curious what for you all let's maybe start with that first big idea that seems to be maybe the most prominent throughout the idea of collaboration. Um, I mean, you would have thought that going into a pandemic and everyone being unable to be in the same room as each other would have been a massive hindrance. Uh, and I'm sure it has been in terms of practicalities, but I'm curious how, you know, in each of your different uh, areas you've managed 
not only to clearly get around the problems of kind of communicating with collaborators, but clearly made hugely really interesting work um, doing so. So I just wondered if you if you wanted to kind of reflect on collaboration in your respective, or indeed kind of if there are things that you want to mention in relation to our, uh, each other's work as well. Do you well, have an order? Or, or, no, oh, no, 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 no. This jump is, in. I... We're going to try and be as free flowing as we can. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll start off by saying that uh, very fortunately, at least for Smart History, it has always been a collaborative venture. From the origins more than 15 years ago, it has always been uh, fostering collaboration. And so that has been very much part of the mission um, of, of now where I work full time. And so I think we were very fortunate in the pandemic pivot to already have um, uh, opportunities and, and I think people have often reach out to us because of that, knowing that we are collaborative. And so I think that for us, we were very fortunate in that it was probably uh, easier uh, since we already had something built in for that. And I think where we have um, tried to, I think, return um, uh, or I say provide other people who I think are finding it more challenging to collaborate, whether that's with students, whether that's amongst themselves, whether that's in doing public facing art history. Um, and that's one of the reasons we have been trying to do some more um, uh, professional development type of workshops to, I think, help people see where they can find collaborative resources. I think this came up earlier, the idea of resources. Um, and so uh, one of the the other things that I think we, we do that, that may not be obvious to people when they come to Smart History is that you know, we really are only as good as the people we work with. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go and write about South Asian materials from the 16th century because I that is not my area of expertise. So we really rely on people reaching out to us. We occasionally reach out to other people as well. Um, but we, you know, we don't force people to write for us. You know, it's whether they believe in the mission of making things freely available um, when that is seems responsible to do that. And so we really do. Um, you know, work with other people, you know, we provide a lot of um, editorial guidance, we have our open peer re review process. And so we are really collaborative from the get go from the reaching out point until it gets published online, and such things. So, um, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about what the, the nitty gritty of that looks like, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there for now. And I'm curious to hear Thanks. from others. Sriya, yeah. Yeah, I, I also wanted to say that in a sense, um, the whole kind of peer review process and publishing in an academic journal isn't very collaborative if you think about it. And I think one of the things that I really enjoyed um, while working with British Art Studies is the fact that there's so much room for collaboration. And I think being on uh, being fully digital definitely uh, plays a big role in that. Uh, and um, and the fact that the the production team is fantastic, and we're also very lucky to be very well funded um, by the two institutions um, that support us. So. Um, but for example, one of the things that you can do is, is of course, send in uh, a, a manuscript, um, but also pitch us an idea and say, this is the kind of material that I'm going to be working with. What kind of tools can you build um, to, um, to sort of help showcase this material in a way that can't be showcased in, in another um, academic journal? Um, and, and also things like, um, I think this is quite interesting also for peer reviewers to get uh, material that are proposals really. Um, so proposals are peer reviewed, something like animating the archive uh, would be, we'd ask for uh, comments from referees and then uh, produce something and then send it back uh, to either the same or different referees. So there's kind of different processes, um, but it really allows editors to work with, uh, the editorial team to work with, um, with scholars who are writing, um, but, um, and for the production team to get to um, build things that are used for other, uh, you know, sort of um, articles and uh, features as well. So, so in that sense, I think it's been a really different experience, and I and I wonder how it's going to keep evolving as well. Hmm. Thanks, Sandy or Dan. Do you want to come in on that? Otherwise, they're saying, um, "Sorry, jump in." Yeah, I would love to. If is my video yeah, and audio yeah. working at the same yes, time? Yes, we see you. Yes, we see you and hear you. Great. OK. <laughs> um, collaboration, I feel like, has become, uh, for us at least, it's 
taken to the forefront in a way that perhaps we had thought about these things in the past, but hadn't driven towards them as furiously as we are now. So we've had a great chance to work with uh, bringing together different scholars in the field. And also one of the things that I'm most excited about is um, gaining access to collections and having curators give um, talks with the objects from their collection. So for example, um, Elizabeth Williams at the uh, Dumbarton Oaks uh, sh created a presentation showing us two Byzantine textiles from their collection. So collaboration has been key to making our project happen. And again, I think it's something that took on a lot more um, of an impetus uh, with the pandemic. And that that is a really I watched that video and it's really fantastic because you know she's literally sitting in the storeroom speaking to a camera showing you the stuff the kind of especially teaching experience that is um, so you know hugely um, appealing and kind of interesting for students when you can do it in real life and even without a pandemic you know you're relying on colleagues giving up their extremely precious time to do so so it's to be able to bring different kinds of experience again into that space is is really interesting. Um, uh, Dan, I see you're you're busy um, uh, answering uh, questions away in the in the chat. Um, but I, I, there's a um, a question that someone uh, Nadine Zubair um, uh, uh, asks: um, Does the proliferation of online resources require a directory or some way to signpost and collate all the resources a resource of resources, so to speak? And, how do educators and researchers find out about all these rich resources? I think that comes back to what you were saying earlier, Dan, the kind of astronomical pace of change, the very nature of the digital as something that we, um, uh, you know, if we are using it to its full potential, it is bigger than any one person can ever manage. Um, and so how we manage uh, our, both our own expectations and interests there, but also find these collaborative routes. So I don't know if anyone in particular has a kind of comment on this idea of a directory. Yeah, Dan. Okay. Um, I was just say there's been quite a few efforts in the past to try and aggregate resources like that. So I, mm. I don't know how long people have been looking at digital space, but I've been working in museums since 2003. There have been various European Union projects that have been funded like BRICS, which uh, was a gazetteer or directory of resources. And then there's things like Europeana, which do aggregate lots of cultural data. It sort of depends what you want as well, really, in terms of registry or resource. Um, Classical World Studies does lots of stuff on this, trying to aggregate resources, so things like Pelagios. So there's opportunities for this. I, I think it's one of those things where you need to know exactly what people are after as well, and do your audience research first to find out what you're trying to generate. I mean, Google is perhaps still the biggest provider of cultural information, with Wikipedia next. And I think if you're not making your resources open access, they're not getting out to the major audiences as well. And I think Lauren talked about that earlier and looking at other people's resources, they've all had a Creative Commons license. And at the moment, we're quite restrictive in Cambridge with our license. We don't allow derivatives. Well, that's useless for you as an art historian. You can't take a picture off and crop it and put it on your website. So that's another knock-on effect as well. So if we're open with what we're doing, people will discover us and reuse it. It's serendipity. That's the really big key to what we're doing. I mean, I don't want to be telling people how they should use a resource. And I don't want to reinforce that cultural divide as well. An Egyptian can't use images of our collection belong to their culture because we say you must pay to use them. That's just enforcing colonialism in many ways. Um, but I think going back to that thing about directory, it is achievable now. You, there are ways of doing it. Um, but does your audience want it? You could be building it for one person. That's... Mm. Are there any in particular other than Europeana that you would kind of point anyone interested to that you uh, think are, are particularly useful? Um, I wouldn't say particularly useful because we all have different studies and, and specialties. Uh, I'd say watch this space a little bit for the UK because there's a project going on towards a national collection by the, being funded by the AHRC, which is working about how to make that collection accessible in a, a major way. It, it is very much a UK focused thing, but the technology should be reusable by other places if it comes up. So things like IIIF, and linked data and these sort of things bring those resources together and if lauren or sria can use it or sandy in the same way so we always use the same technology it makes it democratic and it goes back to a question that you might pick up in a bit later about photogrammetry so i'll stop talking and see if anyone else wants to jump in yeah does anyone else want to comment on the on the um kind of resource a directory kind of um, element yeah lauren well, I, I will just say two things about it, two different things. And the first is that, I, I mean, I think what Dan was saying is it's it's really important to know kind of what people are looking for. But of course, sometimes that's very challenging if, you know, you don't know what 
you know exactly who your your audience is because you have so many different audiences it can be hard to predict and so one of the ways that we've tried to help with that as smart history is that on the uh, bottom of every essay and for most of the videos we have additional resources which are basically pointing to other types of these resources whether it's europeana or whether it's um, you know, uh, a digital online exhibition that that we've kind of vetted and and we can and we feel comfortable that it is both you know accurate and ac there's a certain amount of expertise and that it might be useful for people to then you know dig deeper into these things. And so we are trying to find ways to I think point out to other resources. So uh, you know, there's not just one kind of massive bibliography, but it's unique to each you know object or theme that we're talking about. Um, the other thing I'll mention about that, and this is this is not specific to smart history, is I think where a lot of this has been happening, it's almost a kind of grass, grassroots activism. And I've seen um, over, over the past year, but even before that, where people have wanted some type of you know, database where you can find all of these exciting digital projects in particular. And I think that has been accelerated in our current, this current year. Um, and, you know, for instance, at the Association of Latin American Art, uh, my own expertise is in Latin American art. And, uh, you know, we started a digital resources page on that, um, for that group, which is basically people can write in and share different types of digital repositories, uh, public art history projects. And so we can kind of collect it specific to, uh, you know, Latin American um, art in its, you know, throughout time. And so I think what I've started seeing is a lot of different specific specializations doing more of that type of collecting versus some kind of massive, like all of art history throughout time and place um, type of database, if that's helpful for people. Yeah, it's really interesting to mention the um, a kind of subject association, so to speak. Some of actually the, in many ways, some of the more, what are often seen as some of the more traditional art historical uh, kind of units. Um, but, uh, you know, I would point to some of the really interesting work, for instance, being done by CAA in terms of their um, recent work on um, uh, accessibility and image use and fair use in particular for art historians yes. and artists. Um, you know, the, the AAH I know is doing a lot of work, the Association for Art Historians in the UK is doing a lot of um, related work as well, as I'm sure are all, you know, individual subject institutions. It, it's interesting it's sort of to tie together what both you and Dan are saying. In a sense, it's where your interests lie. And so maybe in many ways, this comes back to just um, you know, the, speaking to people who have the same interests as you and, uh, you know, just in, make sure that we're all incorporating the digital into the kind of collaborative conversations that we have every day about other things anyway. Um, Sreer or Sandy, did you want to jump in? Otherwise, uh, there's a, there's a, there are a few kind of strands of questions that are kind of forming in the chat that I want to maybe um, point us towards. But I think a really interesting one raised by a couple of people here. Um, are about skills um, and about people starting out their careers respectively in art history, public art history, um, academic art history in the museum sector, who people who have asked um, uh, in particular uh, one question by someone called Amy, who uh, asks what would the panel recommend in terms of gaining new skills for positions that may be available in response to these really wonderful new digital domains of the sector. Um, there's another question about early career scholars navigating their way through this. I wonder if there's any particular bits of advice, either from the world of museums, uh, research projects, um, public history, or, or, or journals um, that you would offer in particular to people who are starting out into or really thinking of how they can, I guess that works for people across the entire spectrum of their career. I know plenty of people who are quite late in their career who are turning to this, but in particular thinking about people who are trying to break into that world, so to speak, what would you have to say to them? Swear, I see you're nodding. Yeah, maybe just to say that um, one of the things um, at British Art Studies that we've been discussing quite a lot has been the fact that we we're lucky to have a lot of institutional backing and funding, and that allows us to do a, um, a lot of these kinds of publishing ventures. And um, the managing editor of the journal Baby Card, especially, has been really um, thinking a lot about. Uh, providing resources as well as uh, publishing workshops, not just where to publish, but also how, how to publish on a budget and um, kind of what kind of skills and so on. And we hope to have um, a, a separate uh, link to resources uh, once we've collated various things, um, sort of more technical.
resources uh, on the website. Um, one of the things, and I can put this in the chat, um, choir is, um, which is made by the Getty, is a free and open platform for online art history publishing. So maybe this also can um, speak to some that Pika asked in the chat about uh, easy, um, expensive access uh, to, to, uh, to various kinds of things. But in this case, it's online publishing. I'll just put it in the chat. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Lauren, did you, was that a? The, the was, sorry. I, I, yes, sorry, go for it. The netiquette, you know. Um, I, I'm just seeing a couple of folks writing about as some of these issues, and I, I've noticed a couple of others, Jennifer and Kristen, talking about early career uh, art historians, and especially as you know, there are fewer jobs and or people are electing to leave academic positions, and and what kind of uh, opportunities or pathways are we potentially um, allowing, or, or how are we trying to help? Help maybe emerging scholars, and so I thought I I've been waiting for this moment. I was hoping someone would ask about this um, in part because this is something that's very important to not only myself but the rest of the team at Smart History. Um, we've all chosen somewhat alternative careers, um, you know, outside of you know we've all kind of left tenure positions to to do something that we really believe in uh, that will. I think broaden the field of art of art history, and so to address some of those questions very specifically, um, we are very open to anyone who who has expertise. You don't have to be a tenured professor to be collaborating with us. There are, you know, we we recognize that um, that is not the traditional model, and so we really much, very much enjoy working with um, emerging scholars in part because they have a different sense of the direction of the discipline of art history than say, you know, someone even, I feel like I'm going to out myself here, but you know, I finished more than a decade ago in, the, in you know, the PhD and, and things are very different, whether that's methods and theories and approaches and, and topics and such things. Um, one of the ways that we've been trying to really help particularly early career art historians who have been affected by COVID is uh, we have uh, money from the Mellon Foundation to support early career art historians uh, with uh, certain honoraria. And so we just finished actually 43 essays by early career art historians. And it just so happens that we have another round of funding that was made available to that we just uh, published on uh, Friday uh, for 30 more of these honoraria to support uh, emerging scholars in art history. So if that is something that you are interested in learning more about, you can find information on Smart History or you can reach out to me and I'm happy to share that because we do recognize that particularly early career historians, they've lost job opportunities, um, jobs that have fallen through, opportunity, and we really want to try to help um, these you know, people who are in more challenging positions than we are. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll say about particularly trying to help early career art historians is that I think we all, we also see our role is really trying to kind of mentor um, art historians, I guess, of any, wherever they are in their career in terms of public facing art history, but also what it means to publish, you know, in the online environment. And so we, like I said, we we go through many different rounds of, of feedback, but we also are, are kind of trying to help them think about what it means to write for a very different type of public than if you know I'm writing an essay for an academic journal in my field for other scholars. It requires a different type of engagement uh, with your with your audience, and and so trying to help people think about how to engage um, art history in a very different way potentially. So, thanks, Lauren. That's really nice, and it's it's very heartening. I'm sure um, any any career. Um, uh, individuals on the call will agree to hear that this is work that is being kind of you know financially um, uh, um, honoured in some ways. I yes. mean, it's really interesting thinking across the different resources presented here and others that I'm pulling into my head, and to what degree these uh, actually rely on the goodwill of um, people to contribute to what is essentially you know this uh, an op open source set of information. Um, and it's excellent to hear that some support is being offered to those. Um, it, it, who are you know starting out in these careers to be able to do that and something that I would hope we can all lobby uh, our respective um, you know um, funders and institutions to to make sure um, grows and continues. Um, was there uh, Dan or Lord Sri or, or Sandy? Did you want to kind of uh, Sandy? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I love this question about if we're reaching out to masters and PhD students because I'm a PhD student myself. So this is a first and foremost uh, issue on my mind in terms of market viability, but uh, our team itself is made up of one senior scholar uh, and tenured professor. And then the rest of us are, we have two PhD students, um, one, or sorry, three PhD students um, two early emerging scholars and actually one undergraduate who's on our team. She's amazing. She runs the social media. She's doing an amazing job. But I will say we also have been paying, um, we've been compensating contributors who contribute to the project. And uh, we have been trying to target emerging voices in the field exactly for the reasons that Lauren is describing in terms of they're looking at different issues than we see with the um, more senior scholars who established the canon of the field. And now the younger scholars are saying, okay, let's look at this in a different way. Um, and the hope is, is that for the emerging scholars, particularly those who want to work in the field of academia, our goal is that they could then, we can build this platform up to the point where they could then use the videos or presentations they've created for us as their portfolio when they apply for jobs. So they can say, I can teach to, uh, college educated audience um, who has a background in Islamic art, but I can also do this work that reaches a broader audience. Like we're gonna break down the ivory tower by having material that speaks to a range of people is the goal. So it's one of the driving impetuses of Hansine and I hope we can continue to produce content with emerging scholars as time goes on. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, um... Just looking at the, the chat, there are all sorts of quite a lot of specifically technical questions that I think Dan is responding to, and these we'll try and capture as well as we can. Uh, Liv, our, our rapporteur for the workshop, is going to kind of pull as many of these together so that we can share them. But a number of questions are also coming up. I mean, it seems that to segue in directly from what you were just talking about, uh, Sandy, in terms of the canon uh, and in terms of accessibility, different kinds of audiences. I mean, there was a question asked early on and a number of which relate to it in different ways about making museums, um, learning spaces, universities more, um, in fact, art history, a more democratic uh, place, um, different kinds of people being able to access that. I wonder, uh, in particular, uh, Dan, I mean, I know you mentioned in, um, uh, um, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, citizen science, some things that you've been doing to bring people into the creation or different kinds of people in different kinds of places into the creation of the work. Um, maybe we could take it in turn thinking about kind of making our material and then disseminating our material as a, as a which seem to be maybe two slightly different parts of this democratic breadth. So in terms of making, I mean, in terms of crowdsourcing citizen science, I mean, what, what are the kind of things that are happening in the Fitzwilliam in terms of um, democratic creation of your resources? Um, I, th I think that's quite an interesting question to go on with. And there's, there's a, a question in the, the chat as well about how we create 3D resources and the 360 degree tours as well, which fits with this as well. And, and we are using in-house resources. I mean, the pandemic has cut down on opportunities for people to come into the museum space and, and do things. So people are becoming very self-sufficient and learning new things. And this is what's draining digital departments quite heavily as well, because colleagues are coming up to them with ideas saying, how can we generate this stuff? How do we do this new thing? I think Sandy's probably done this with her colleagues, it's by the sounds of it. You've got a colleague who's known how to done it and done it really quickly. But you can do so much by yourself with very cheap technology and you can enable people to create things with you. So Art Talks asked, what do we use to create 3D capture films and museum tours? Well, we use our museum photographer to capture the 360 degree tour. The photography for 3D images are done by me generally or curators. So I've taught curators how to do this but you can also enable the public to create 3D models as well. So one of the things we did with Micropass, which is an Arts Humanities Research Council project, uh, we asked the public to help us make 3D models by drawing around the backgrounds and removing them. And then we taught them how to make 3D models for themselves. But there's so many other things people could do as well. So Sandy might say, we've got an Islamic uh, car catalog in a museum. It needs transcribing. You could phot photograph those cards and put them up onto a platform like Zooniverse or Pybossa and ask the public to join in and, and transcribe them. And generally you do it three to five times and you double check them to find out whether there's a similarity. And then the challenge is getting that data back into the organization, but it's about giving people the chance to correspond or participate in your organization. There are things you can do. You might be shut, but there's things that you can put out there. It's the digitization part that's the hard part generally and finding someone to collaborate with. 
Um, I, I don't want to say too much because I know we've only got 15 minutes. So I'll, I'll stop there in case someone else wants to jump in on that. That's really interesting. And I, I like it was something I would certainly for um, those in the audience who are colleagues teaching art history in universities, I would really just uh, absolutely champion the point that Dan just made about um, there being actually mu so much, so many very simple, freely available resources that we can to you know create. We're creating so much material for our students. It would be really interesting to say, you know, are these things that will also connect with some of these other much, you know, uh, more perhaps much broader um, uh, public facing. Um, projects which we could then you know bring some of this material which is so pointed uh, to just a few people but actually maybe it's something to be hugely useful uh, in a broader sense um, for the public and also for other colleagues who are doing other kinds of teaching it's quite empowering in, in, in that sense in terms of a kind of diversity in the creation of material was there something that um, the other panelists wanted to mention or indeed thinking more about the dissemination of material I mean Pika Gersh one of our um, uh, contributors makes the comment about um, accessing or getting material out to students uh, um, who are um, um, perhaps um, outside of you know, traditional routes um, in other places around the world. Um, I'm trying to find the specific nature of our question, but I got here we go. Uh, yes, so uh, um, you know, digital projects which are often immensely expensive for students in poorer countries without as much access to basic technologies that support these ventures. Uh, Lauren, you mentioned it in terms of smart history, the the book. Um, a kind of version to download rather than necessarily having people who have free and easy internet connections. But is there anything either that smart history or British art studies or, or have seen kind of wanted to that you wanted to kind of mention in relation to those? Sorry, Sandy, is that a, a wave? Sandy, do you Actually, I... Sorry, Lauren goes Sandy, Lauren first and then, then Sandy. <laughs> no, Lauren, please, please. Oh, okay. No, I just, I, you know, we, um, you know, I think equity and access are really, I mean, they're always, they've always been important uh, to what we're doing. And I think they are, they continue to be very important in, in this year of 2020 and just beyond in part because, uh, you know, yes, everything at Smart History is accessible if you have an internet connection, but we're very aware that that is not the case for many parts of the world, whether that's zero internet connection, reliable internet connection, consistent internet connection. And um, so yes, all of our materials are free. Uh, so we are constantly trying to think of ways that we can, I don't wanna say get around that, but that where we can try to find different ways to aid uh, that particular need and so things like these books, you know, yes, you need an internet connection to, to download them. Uh, but then of course, once they are downloaded or if someone else is able to download them and then they can be, you know, copied and disseminated, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that some of these types of things can provide more people uh, with access to this knowledge and this material in, in certain ways. And so, you know, if there are other folks who are in the audience, since I can't see you, but, uh, you know, if you, if you have creative ways of thinking about this, you know, you can always reach out um, or, or ask more questions, but I would love to hear from, from Sandy and others about what they're also doing. Sandy, in particular, it'd be great to hear you mentioned a kind of multilingual approach to it, which I think is really, you know, something we've not quite touched upon here because we're talking about a kind of diversity of audiences and yet really the resources that we're talking about often are Anglophone. Um, so especially given the kind of nature of the Hamsin project as being one um, um, related to a particular part of the world and a particular set of linguistic traditions, how, how do you, how does Hamsin see that playing out? Yeah, um, that actually, there's two points I want to bring up with that, but I'll, the first one will be directly t speaking to language barrier in terms of cross-lingual. Um, our, our later stage, um, one thing that we've been thinking about since the beginning, but we will realize in a later stage is to have our videos also translated into Arabic, Turkish, and Persian, and potentially more languages as we have the resources. It's a huge undertaking, but it's mm -hmm. important for our field. Uh, because so many people exist in areas that are not English speaking and we want to really work on sort of stitching together the international community that makes up the Islamic art field. Um, another issue about accessibility that is actually hits a little bit closer to where we are right now with our videos is the idea of um, captioning. We've learned some really interesting things from captioning, which is that um, 
with AI captioning, it's of course, it's always going to muddle what is said. It doesn't always pick up um, words exactly um, as you hear them, particularly if anyone has an accent of any form. Um, but one of the really interesting things with this project was uh, captioning um, specialized terminology or even just names of buildings and things like that. So if we are talking about the Mirage Name, which is a manuscript about the Prophet Muhammad's ascension um, into heaven, you know, it can't pick up the word Mirage Name. It translates it into something else. That showed us that actually when we're teaching undergraduate students, they might not be hearing the terminology that we're saying, even in our classrooms, taking out of like ignoring the digital realm. It showed us that when we use certain term, terms, what a student hears could be totally different from what we think we're, we are attending to say, essentially. So that was a really interesting learning experience and something that with the videos as they exist now, we're putting captioning on all of them, including the specialized terminology so that people will become familiar with that. Growing out of the, uh, that idea was also to create a glossary, this multilingual glossary, which will probably be the first space in which we offer multilingual content. Um, so having these specialized terms, then offering um, a definition for that term in English, Persian, Turkish, and Arabic is the ultimate goal, which gets to some really, that could be a helpful resource as well for scholars all around the world, regardless of their level, whether they know what the term is, because there's a lot of really interesting translation dynamics that come into that. Um, so that's where we're at. And we're thinking a lot about accessibility via language, just to begin with as the first space. Um, it's going to take a lot of work, though. Translation is not easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shreya, I'm curious how this um, kind of comes into the, um, whether this is, I mean, it's interesting because British Art Studies as a, uh, as a journal with a mission to look at British art has a much more Anglophone, um, one presumes, um, certainly a much more Anglophone body of material, um, and yet it's about disseminating that material as broadly as possible. So it'd be really interesting to think how that works yeah. in, in terms of journals. Do you accept uh, um, submissions in languages other than English? So at, at the moment, it's it's only English, but at the right. same time, it is looking at British art, but also really in its in its widest context. And one of the right. things that we've constantly been talking about, and I think mm. um, we will have up on the website as well, is what what is British art and, and um, especially if you think about colonial um, pasts and so on as well. But I think thinking about accessibility, coming to it from a slightly different way um, and especially from uh, the point of view of an academic journal, something that we've been talking about a lot is um, uh, archives that get represented. So the archives that people tend, scholars tend to write about are really archives that are easy to access, have a lot of money to be able to digitize their stuff. Um, and especially during the pandemic, it's it's become really evident in terms of uh, what kinds of things get written about more. And uh, since British Art Studies has, you know, works closely with the Paul Mellon Center and the YCBA, um, and um, there are various fellowships and um, sort of the scope for not just collaboration, but also sort of funding. Um, and this is still things that are in process and we're still talking about talking about it, but one of the things we would really like to do is uh, is collaborate with, um, with smaller archives um, and not necessarily just British archives, but smaller archives who don't have the resources to digitize, um, but use something like the animating the archive feature to to, to showcase some of it, but really in the process, um, use the expertise, expertise of the production team, as well as funding uh, for other um, expertise needed to digitize these archives and, and then, you know, um, sort of foster uh, scholarship in these areas. So the Polman Center also has smaller sort of uh, research funding and um, that could also be channeled towards uh, various things. So this is definitely something thing that has been so not just in Britain but also in the Caribbean South Asia and so on um, uh, and I know in our because obviously as, as uh, someone who's now uh, theoretically based between you know Switzerland and um, uh, Italy um, I'm curious how you in terms of you know maybe your experience less as a, as a kind of contributing editor but more as a researcher I mean are there uh, um, what's your sense of how um, some of the resources that we've been talking about in the journals like like your own uh, are working or with or against the currents of things maybe happening in Europe? Is that something that is 
because uh, I, I feel like I'm just even struggling off the top of my head beyond big institutional repositories to think of a material that I'm familiar with in my field that's happening in German, in Italian, in French. And I know that's there because I know the bibliography, you know, the people who are writing that material. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of multilingual world that I have access to through books and journal articles. But uh, in some ways, I feel like less so in the digital space. Is that, well, <laughs> is that my bad for not being a, as kind of well versed in what I know is this the breadth of the field? In the digital realm in the way that I am in my research in a more traditional sense or or is that I'm curious what your sense of what's happening in Europe is as someone based there yeah I think it's um from whatever little that I um, know about this is that it's it's still very much of a developing field in a sense and so um like Daniel was saying as well I think it depends a bit on your on your interests and um and there's isn't really kind of an overarching way to find things uh, yet. And I'm, I'm also really curious about what sorts of uh, what collaboration and funding and so on will mean after Brexit uh, for for sort of uh, European collaboration as well. And I, I like with everything else, we'll just have to wait and see what agreements are made. But um, I, I think um, these are also kind of broader political concerns that would impact something like this. Um, but also at the Consistorisches Institute, we have been talking quite a lot about making, um, making resources available um, to sort of uh, non-European uh, contexts as well and how, how to do that as art historians and so working towards a democratic art history. So it's, uh, so it's really a question that's um, that everyone's thinking about it, uh, at least in my circles. Um, I am um, looking at the time and uh, the comment from one um, audience member that it's hitting midnight in their time zone. So I'm afraid we're kind of getting towards the end, but I wonder if I could, I could all just maybe pull together two uh, questions here um, uh, that are coming in that maybe just to ask each of you to, as a kind of your final thought. Um, one is about um, uh, anything that you've seen in your platform that radically uh, represents knowledge or makes us think about things in a different way. And also another question about, you know, a slightly future, future perspective one about the uh, advances that you're most interested, excited about, or that you're hoping the most for, maybe the problem or the challenge that you're hoping the most for to be, to be solved in a sense in the next 10 or so years. Um, so uh, I don't know if maybe why don't we go in the order that we were kind of um, uh, we uh, um, met you so to speak um, um, and uh, if there's any kind of a particular some you know, what's the most the thing that you're most excited about I suppose uh, um, that's coming up uh, Lauren you see me smiling over here <laughs> no I just want to say that I the the comment that was asking about um, how you know the the digital environment offers opportunity to challenge conventions is one that's very important to me and it's one that has um, that I've been thinking about for more than a decade even before I joined smart history full time and so now that I um, am full time at smart history I get to think about this daily and so I thought I would at least um, note a couple of ways in which we are trying to really challenge some of the biases inherent in art history as a discipline and also the you know the colonial legacies that are kind of ingrained into the discipline in terms of its origins and such things. And so uh, I'll just give, like I said, a couple of examples and I'm happy to speak more. Uh, one of them, for instance, is for the past year and a half, we have had an initiative called the Expanding the Renaissance Initiative. And this has been essentially to do this, to challenge how we think about and categorize and talk about what we consider to be the Renaissance, uh, whether and and you know if you go and you read more about the project, you'll see that we've I have a very conscientiously um, lowercase the Renaissance to kind of decenter and also to just immediately note that we are kind of destabilizing some of those categories and it really is to not only challenge how we think about the Renaissance, where it was, who participated, who was forced to participate. Um, you know, uh, unwillingly, uh, but also to even think about the different types of things get, that get excluded from this, 
uh, where we think about the Renaissance and how that's been, how we can kind of play with that. And so we are thinking about ways and, and the materials for that project are collected from a lot of different geographic locations. So if you go to just Italy, you know, you'll see that, but if you go to different parts, if you go to China, if you go to Mexico, if you go to uh, Peru, you're going to see different types of materials that are kind of collected under this initiative. Um, one of the other aspects of that initiative and some of the other ones that we're working on are also to think about who gets to do the writing about these things. And so we are really trying to work with scholars and amplify voices that have been um, marginalized, have been overlooked, have been set aside because they are kind of pushing up against the grain of what we consider to be this very canonical um, era of time. And so, you know, we are, like I said, daily trying to think about ways that we can really um, address some of those larger issues. And so, I, like I said, I'm happy if people want to talk more with me after this, you can find me at Smart History. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, why do we get the order that we that we spoke to Sria, then Sandy, then Dan? The thing that you're most excited about um, coming up in the next ten or so years. Um, yeah, well, I think maybe just to speak in the in the very big picture, and this relates a lot to what um, Dan presented as well. I think one of the things that would be really interesting for um, an open access ac uh, academic journal is to look at the way that researchers use archives and what kind of archives, um, as I mentioned, and so on. But also. As the uh, landscape changes, the sort of research landscape changes, that will also be reflected in the journal. So things like, um, so something I'm, I'm really curious about, Dan, is uh, how do you see, uh, in a sense, this kind of 3, uh, 3D um, kind of visualization and ways of putting things uh, online, um, changing the ways we think about repatriation issues and what museums should have and what they should give back and uh, sort of decentering kind of the universal museum questions as well. And I think that sort of thing would really also reflect, and this is not, not to put you on the spot and ask you uh, what you think about it, but I, I think more broadly, it's, uh, I, I think the digital has opened up spaces that will initiate a lot of theoretical discourse as well as, uh, as, well as that historical discourse that, I find really exciting and democratizing and uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing where it goes. Thanks, Sreya. Sandy. Oh, so many things, so many things to look forward to, including the end of the pandemic, hopefully. Um, I really honestly coming out of this conversation, especially, I just feel very energized and I know the other team members from Hansim who are here probably do as well in terms of the fascinating questions people have been asking us because I push our project in new directions, um, opportunities for collaboration. Um, digital has, I'm admittedly not a very digital person. I don't, I never really actively engaged with it as much as I should uh, have. And now I see all the potential and I'm excited to think about ways in which our platform and collaborating with other platforms can really connect scholars around the world in a way that perhaps uh, hasn't been achieved yet. So keeping the dialogue going and finding ways to work across boundaries as more boundaries seem to appear given to us by political entities, we can dismantle them ourselves in the digital realm. Thanks, Sandy. And Dan? Um, just listening to everyone else there, I think democratizing of work is really coming up really across everyone's uh, comments as well. I think what I'd like to see over the next 10 years is a value for digital being placed on the scholarship as well, so that people get the, the worth of doing this work and it's not just sort of seen as a tack on. And I think we, we've got to see museum directors actually valuing digital for what it does for their organisation as well and breaking down the boundaries of the organisation. But we also got to think about the ethics of what we're doing as well. And some of the comments have been about whether we've got that sort of digital privilege of being able to produce this stuff and what duty we have for the other people around the world who don't have access to funding or the equipment? How do we enable them to be able to do the same things? Because otherwise we've got that sort of ivory tower being built off of the people who can produce this stuff and then the museum that can't. And if you go to these conferences, people will say museums should be able to do this. But my curator down the road, who's only got one member of staff is sitting there going, I can't do this. In 10 years time, hopefully they can because they've been empowered to learn this stuff and they can do it. But of course they've got other things to do as well. So it's always gonna be slightly unequal, but how do we get around that? And I think um, Sreya's comments about the small archives and the melanin and British uh, art studies. That's really important. 
It's about how we make sure we don't leave them behind. Well, I think that's an excellent place to, to, to finish on with, with no archive left behind. And I hope that really together what we've offered is a bit of a, a call to arms, so to speak, um, uh, not just to think about the, um, the kind of ethical and theoretical dimensions of, of what uh, we've been talking about, but really to, you know, on a, in a practical level, um, I'm sure everyone here, whether you're connected as a, a user or a creator, in um, the museum world, the uh, academic world, the public history world has a huge amount of collective knowledge to give. And I hope it's really fascinating to see in the chat all sorts of information being shared with each other about people who seem energized in connecting, collaborating. Um, we'll try and gather together as much of that material as we can. Thank you so much for sharing all of the material in the chat. And um, uh, I really want to, to thank all of our um, for panelists for sharing their expertise so eloquently and engagingly. Thank you very much. It's been really inspiring. Um, and uh, also to thank our authors who are, uh, I've seen uh, some contributing and some um, uh, watching. Do go and check out Quartal Books Online and the continuous page. Um, um, but otherwise, um, best of luck with your digital projects. And um, I really hope that we've uh, been able to kickstart not just a conversation, but some tangible um, material uh, change in what you're all able to think about and to do to share with each other. So thank you very much. Thanks to the Quarter for hosting us and um, bye.